As Tom mentioned, my name is Levi Zitting. I'm a developer at Mostly Serious. Uh, Mostly Serious is a digital agency here in Springfield. Uh, we do a lot of marketing type work and also a lot of custom website development. And for a lot of these custom websites that we build, um, usually they're very marketing focused websites. And when we're building a marketing website, the most important tool in our toolbox has to be our content management system, or CMS for short. Raise your hands real quick. Who has heard of a CMS before? Most everyone's heard of, of a CMS before. So are we kind of familiar with the idea behind it? What are some ones that uh, others have used in the room real quick? Just yell them out. WordPress. WordPress? I knew that that was going to be a number one. Yep. Django. Uh, Django is, it has kind of a CMS behind it. Um, there's a basic admin, but Wagtail is kind of the more popular um, CMS that's built on top of Django. So I'm here today to talk about kind of an up and coming CMS. Um, it's been around for a few years, but the latest version came out in April and kind of, it was a complete rewrite of the previous version. It comes with a lot of really slick, awesome features. And it's something that we use a lot at Mostly Serious. And this CMS is called Craft. Um, Craft is published by a company that used to be an agency called Pixel and Tonic. They are now full-time working on Craft. They have a team of developers constantly working on this product. Um, right off the bat, I want to call, off, call out a couple of really awesome features about Craft. So um, one that is kind of the headlining feature, in my opinion, is the fact that Craft is very flexible to your model of content or structure of content. Um, it comes with almost no opinions about how content should be structured in terms of how people edit it and, and how people access it. Um, compare that to WordPress, which many of you are familiar with. WordPress at its core is really a blogging platform and has, is not really a CMS. And so there's a lot of opinions about you know, blog posts and all the various fields that go on blog posts. Craft comes with none of that out of the box, which mean, and instead gives you tools to totally customize what that structure should look like. Um, another really awesome feature about Craft um, is the asset manager. This is something that a lot of CMSs can just fall short on, is managing assets. Um, Craft has a really robust way to search all the various assets on your, on your current site, and also it comes with a built-in like image editor in the browser, so users can crop their images and resize and rotate them all from within the CMS, which is kind of a unique feature that I haven't seen in a lot of places. Um, another really powerful feature about Craft is its live preview mode. So uh, as a content editor, you would come into Craft, you would sit down and write up your blog post or whatever it is you're trying to do to the site, and you'd be presented with this list of fields you would need to fill out. At the top of that, there's this button called Live Preview, where you are presented with a slightly different UI where all those fields are just off to the left, and your live site is on the right. And as you make changes to those fields on the left, the site automatically reloads with those changes on the right, so you can easily see what your content's gonna look like once it goes live without having to save and check a preview page or worse, like actually push it live to see what it's gonna look like. Um, and then also kind of the last big feature um, that is awesome about Craft is their plugin ecosystem. Uh, earlier this week, Craft announced on Twitter that they had reached over 500 plugins on their plugin store and more are being added almost every single day. Um, a couple of like high, highly rated, highly used plugins that are honestly some of the reasons I would choose Craft if I was like starting my own personal project. Um, one of those is an S a plugin called SEOmatic, which is a really amazing uh, SEO management plugin. It takes all the hassle out of managing anything SEO related, whether that's meta tags, structured data, social image sharing stuff, all that kind of stuff. It, it takes the pain out of it. Um, and then another one, and a, a reason lots of people use Craft is Craft Commerce, which is, an, it's actually made by Pixel and Tonic, the people who make Craft, and it's an entire e-commerce solution built on top of Craft. Um, it's kind of pricey. It, most Craft plugins that are really good usually have some pricing associated with them, but in many cases, it's actually a good thing because it encourages the developers to continue fixing bugs and adding awesome features instead of just it being free all the time. I also will mention that Craft itself is open source, even though you normally need to pay a licensing fee to use it. Um, all of the code is available on GitHub, and they accept pull requests um, on really any of their projects. And every Craft plugin, as far as I know, is also on GitHub and open source as well. 
Okay, so let's talk a little bit about some of the more technical aspects of Craft. Um, Craft, at its core, is a PHP-based application. So when you deploy it, you deploy it like you would any normal PHP app. Um, it uses um, either MySQL or Postgres underneath the hood. It's, um, you can choose either of those database platforms, although most Craft plugins tend to support MySQL before Postgres. Um, but across the board, support is really great for both of them. Um, Craft is also built on top of the Yee framework, which is a PHP web framework. It's not super popular these days, but you also need to know very little of the framework to do much in Craft. You would only ever have to know something about Yee if you want to make like a Craft plugin um, or, some, or extend Craft in some way beyond what it can do out of the box. <clears throat> Excuse me. The last kind of technical aspect of Craft is the Twig templating language. Um, Twig is actually has nothing to do with Craft. It comes from the Symfony framework, which is, a, which is another really popular PHP framework, um, which is actually a really good, good thing, in my opinion, because when the CMS doesn't provide its own proprietary templating language, that means all the time you spend learning it means that it's very portable to other projects, because Twig can be used in really any PHP-based application and not just in Craft. I see, I've seen plenty of CMSs that come with their own proprietary language for templating things out. Um, and it's not a bad thing necessarily, but I would prefer it to be something more agnostic than, than very specific. Okay, so there's some technical stuff out of the way. Next, I'm going to kind of walk through how you would install Craft, set up a brand new Craft project, and then we'll switch over to a brand new craft project that I've slightly modified with some kind of basic front end. And we're gonna build out a very simple blogging website. Um, it's basically just kind of a bootstrap template because we're not worrying about visuals here. I'm just trying to show off craft itself. Um, and then if we have time after I go through that demo, um, I have an actual craft project that we built at Mostly Serious for one of our clients that I can show off to show what this looks like full of content and with a much more robust structure than what we're gonna be able to put together in the quick little demo. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and install Craft. So I'm going to pop open my terminal here and let me zoom in a little bit. Um, can you guys kind of see this? Do we need to maybe turn off some lights? Yeah, let me see if I can turn that on. Okay. Um, we're not going to be looking at the t terminal too long. I'm going to go into a temporary directory. Let me make sure I didn't have one left over. Okay. So to start a brand new craft project, I'm going to use um, a command line tool called Composer, which if you're familiar with PHP, you've probably heard of Composer. Composer is PHP's go-to package manager for managing third-party dependencies, and craft embraces Composer. Um, entirely. You install it through Composer. You also manage all of the plugins on your site through Composer, which is a really awesome advantage in many scenarios like with WordPress. You end up having to download the source code for that plugin and drop it into your project, and that's how you install and manage plugins. Instead, with Craft, you do all that kind of stuff through Composer, which is a much better experience. Um, so I'm going to say Composer create project, and then I'll say Craft CMS forward slash CMS, and I'm gonna give it a the name of a folder I want to set this project up in. So the name of the folder will just be Craft Demo. And what this is gonna do is download this Craft CMS CMS package from uh, the PHP package repository Packagist, and then it's going to as soon as it downloads it, it's going to run a Composer install, which will install all of the dependencies needed for the project. This will take just a second. While that's running, let me go ahead and open this up in my editor real quick. Wrong folder. Okay, that's the one. And this is almost done. Come on. Of course it runs slow during a presentation. <laughs> Only when I really need it to go fast. Okay, while that's running, <clears throat> let's kind of jump in and look at the basic uh, folder structure that it's set up here for me. So let me zoom in way here. Okay. Oh, 
I know why it's taking so long. I think I downloaded the wrong package. I think that's supposed to be forward slash craft. Oh well, we'll, uh, we'll just look at the one that I already have set up. So this, presentation. This is what we should have seen there. Um, so this is essentially the same set of files that we get when we install uh, when we install craft. So right up here at the top, we have this top level config directory. This contains a whole bunch of configuration for craft. Not super important. We're not going to dive into there. Um, modules. This is where we would add essentially custom plugins. Um, craft calls plugins that are that you're responsible for modules. They're essentially the plugins that can't be uninstalled from Craft. The storage directory contains a whole bunch of temporary files that run Craft. Um, you know, caches for templates, um, log files, all that kind of stuff lives in there. Templates, this is where we actually write our twig code that Craft will execute. Um, vendor, this comes from Composer. All of our Composer packages are installed in this folder. And then this web directory contains it's essentially our public directory for our site, so we would put any JavaScript files or CSS files in this folder. Um, also in here is this index.php file, which is essentially the entry point into our PHP application. So when we deploy this app, we would want to make sure that our web server points at that file and that every request gets routed through that index.php file. Um, we have this .env file, and this is kind of a, an environment-specific configuration for Craft. So if I pop this open, I have things in here like my current environment, um, whether that's dev or production, um, my database credentials, um, really just that. You can store whatever you want in here though and access it throughout the rest of the system. Um, and this file is obviously not committed to our Git repository. Skip over, skipping down a little bit, here's our composer.json file where we list craft as a dependency and then also any plugins that we installed into the system would also show up in here as dependencies. And then these last two files essentially are the same file. One just works on more Unix-based environments and the other is for Windows-based environments. But Craft comes with its own command line tool with tons of different little commands that you can run. Most of them, um, there's not a ton that come by default, but plugins can also add their own commands in here as well. So one thing that I'm gonna do really quick is pop open my terminal and I'm gonna use that command line tool to set up Craft because I have a completely empty database right now. I've downloaded Craft, now I need to set it up and like install, set up all the database tables and stuff that Craft needs. So I'll say Craft forward slash setup. It's gonna ask what database credentials or what database driver I'm using. And I've entered all this information in before, but this is what you would normally, the, the kind of steps you would normally go through if the uh, previous command had worked like it was supposed to. Uh, my database server is on localhost. My database user is Levi Zitting. I have no database password here. Craft demo is the name of the database. It's asking for a table fruit prefix, so if this database is shared with other systems, we could prefix it with a, a specific string so that we don't clash with any other database tables. And then it saves all these out to that .env file so that we don't have to enter them in again. We do want to go ahead and install Craft right now, so it's gonna ask me for the basic credentials for the root account in Craft. So I'll say the username is admin, the email is my personal email, and the password is, I'm just gonna call it password. Password. And the site name is gonna be craft demo. The site URL, I'm gonna leave it as at web. I'll get into what that is in a few minutes. The site language is in English, and now it's going, going ahead and go create all of our database tables. Uh, let me exit. Actually, I don't have to exit presentation. Um, I'm also going to spin up a web server through my editor to go ahead and serve up requests to Craft. It's just a very basic PHP server. Okay. So with all that out of the way, if I go back to my browser, let's just check that all those database tables were created. Now if I come in here, I should be able to go to localhost 8000 forward slash admin to access the craft UI. And boom, we're in. So I'll go ahead and log in with those credentials. Admin and password. <coughs> okay. 
So right off the bat here, we're presented with this dashboard. Um, the dashboard doesn't have a ton of useful information in here, but we can install plugins to add various types of widgets right here to the dashboard. Um, there's this utilities section. This contains utilities for clearing various caches, checking what our like PHP version is, and also for taking a quick database backup. Um, settings we'll dive into in a second. And then last is the plugin store. And this is where we can install various plugins for our craft site. And we can do it right through the admin interface. So if I go in to install some plugin, um, like this super table plugin, this is a really cool plugin. Um, there's an install button towards the bottom. And what this will do is actually edit my composer.json file to add this um, plugin as a dependency. And then it will rerun a composer install to pull it in. We can also totally disable the plugin store in production so that no one installs a plugin that accidentally breaks anything. So next, let's dive into the settings section. And I'm going to skip over all of this stuff up here in system. Nothing's super important to the demo, um, but a lot of kind of base configuration is in here, like what are the credentials for sending out emails and that kind of stuff. But everything in craft starts with sections. So um, if I go in here to sections, we don't have any right now. And what, I'm, what, what sections are kind of the top level pieces of content. So let's say I'm going to put together a blog like we're about to do here. I would then create a content or a section called blog posts to store each of the individual posts. And in craft, once we have a section, sections contain what are called entries. So our blog posts section would contain a list of posts which craft would call entries. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's create a section um, called blog posts. So I'll call this blog posts. And this handle right here, it was kind of automatically generated by craft, but it's essentially how are we going to refer to this section later in our template code. Um, so whatever we put here, this is going to end up in our code a lot. Um, and then at the bottom here, we choose what uh, the URL format should be for entries in this section. Generally, when you're creating sections, every entry in there would have its own unique URL. And in here, it's kind of automatically generated one for me. So once I create this section and then I create a new entry, I should be able to go to forward slash blog dash posts, forward slash, and then whatever the slug is for the post. And that's a, a field that we'll be able to edit on the entry itself. We don't want to call it blog dash posts in the URL. We want to just go with blog. And then the last part is once a request has been made for the entry at this specific URL, what template should craft go and render out? So if I jump back here to my, my editor and I pop open this templates directory, I've created, th this uh, directory is normally pretty empty, so I've set up a pages folder with a handful of templates for the various pieces of our site. So there's a template for our home page, there's a template for our blog detail page and the listing page. So I'm going to tell craft that whenever it gets a URL that looks like blog forward slash and then some slug, it should render out this blog detail template. So I'm going to go back to the admin and say the template that should be rendered is pages and it's automatically completing, auto completing for me the templates that it found. So we'll say blog detail. And I'll go ahead and save that. And as soon as I save that, it added this new section on the left here called entries. And if I jump into entries, we now have this thing called blog posts we can click new entry and now we're creating a brand new blog post. So I'm just going to create one really quickly called test. And um, by default, every entry needs at least a title. That's kind of a minimum required field. Craft wants you to have at least that so it can know what to display in the actual control panel. And then also if um, entries have, their, have a URL, which in most cases they will, but there's a handful of scenarios where they don't need a URL then craft will automatically also add this slug field to the right hand side here, which we can edit, but it normally just generates based on the title. So I'll go ahead and click save here. We have one new blog post just called test. Um, and if I go to, if I try and go visit this page on the front end, so forward slash blog, forward slash test, we should see an HTML page rendered out. And this is all just static content in that base or that blog detail file. So in a minute here, we'll hook all this up to some real fields. Um, we have a couple other sections to create, and these sections take on a little bit of a different form. If I go into here to sections, we also need 
a blog listing page for a list of all the blog posts. And then I also set up some basic template code for the home page. So we need a place to store the home page and the blog listing. And since those are like really unique pages, there's not going to be two home pages on our site. That doesn't normally make a lot of sense. And there's not going to necessarily be two blog listing pages. So Craft has another type of section for those pieces of content called single. So if I go here to single, it's kind of changed the options here a little bit. Instead of providing some dynamic content for the URL, we're just going to kind of hard code what the URL for this uh, specific section should be. So in this case, I'm actually going to create the, I'm creating the home page as the first one. So I'm just going to leave it blank. And Craft, if we have a single section with no URL, Craft will automatically assume that that's the home page. So I'll go ahead and call this home page. And then we'll go ahead and get rid of this here, leave it blank. Oh boy, Craft is having a little bit of a problem here with, there's a handful of bugs in Craft. They're working on it. Um, I might have to reload this page. So let's choose our template first real quick. Call this home page. And we'll get rid of all of this right here. And we're going to change this to be single. OK, there we go. So now if I go back to entries, we now have this singles section. And in here, we have our home page. And there's no fields in our home page. By default, it's just using the section name as the title. But if I jump over to localhost 8000, we should see a home page rendered out. Um, once again, this is all just static content. We'll build up the fields in a second. And then the last page type was the blog listing. And this one is also a single. The template was blog listing. And the actual URL will just be blog. OK, so now if I come back here and change this to just be forward slash blog, now we get a basic blog listing page. Once again, just static content. OK, so uh, on this blog listing page, let's think about the, uh, the content that actually goes on this blog listing page. So we have all of our blog posts, but we actually don't need to enter any of this content in on this page. This can all be pulled in dynamically. Um, so we're, that's actually technically not any content we need to worry about. The only thing we do need to worry about is this um, title here and this description. So I'm going to go add some additional fields to our blog listing section to have those two. So if I go in here to settings, fields, new field, we'll create a new field called headline. Um, this handle, once again, is how we'll access this field in our templates. And this will all make sense in a second once I write some template code. Um, and then we have this drop down here of field type. We're going to leave this as plain text. So let me go ahead and click Save. And then while I'm here really quick, I'm going to create another one that's just called Description. And that'll also be just a plain text field. So now if I go into Settings and Sections, and I'm looking at the list of sections we've created, there's this little button here that says Edit Entry Type. Um, whenever we create a section, sections, unless they're singles, they can have more than one entry type. Um, which is essentially just kind of like if we had a blog page, like a blog detail page, maybe there's several different kinds of blog post. Maybe there's like a news post or one that's just a generic blog post. Those would be different entry types. And those different entry types could have their own sets of field that differ from each other. So I'm, but singles only have one entry type. So I'm going to go into blog listing and click edit entry type. And then I'm prevented with this, I'm presented with this uh, design your f own field layout UI. And this is essentially where we build up, based on the fields we've already created, what fields should be available when someone is editing this piece of content. So if I come over here, I'm going to create a new tab, just call it content. And then right here is just my collection of all the fields I've created in the system, which I've only created two so far. But I can just drag headline and description over into this uh, content tab and click save. And now if I go back to entries, singles, blog listing, we now have a headline field and a description field for this specific piece of content. Okay. 
Um, there's one more piece of content that I want the end user to be able to control about this site, and that is these list of links here up at the top. And since these, these aren't specific to just one page, this piece of content is global across the entire site. Every page would load um, the, the content for these links up here. And so this introduces another piece, a way to store content in Craft, and that's through what's called globals. And these are just pieces of content that are provided to every single page. So I went into settings, globals, and I'm gonna create a new global called navigation, and I'll save that. And now it added globals over here to the sidebar with this option navigation, and there's no fields attached to this navigation right now, so it's, it's saying that it's empty. Um, so if we break down kind of what this navigation should look, to, look like, we essentially want a list of links that users can arbitrarily add to. Um, and so that's gonna, now we're gonna get into some other field types. I showed off the plain text field type, which is a really basic just text input, but Craft has tons of different field types. And one of the most powerful of those field types is called um, the matrix field type, which is essentially a way to do kind of a list of various items. So before I jump into that, I am going to install a plugin. I already had this plugin installed. I just need to activate it. This typed, and I'm gonna activate this other one while I'm in here as well. This typed link field adds a link field type when we're creating new fields, which just has all the various pieces of content you would need for a specific link. So it will let you link to other entries in the system as well as external URLs, and then also give you fields for the anchor tags title attribute and its aria label attribute and stuff like that. So once, now that that's activated, I'm gonna create a new field. We're gonna call this field link group. And I'm gonna come down here and create, set the field type to be matrix. <clears throat> and now that it's set to matrix, we presented with a slightly different UI to configure this field. We're presenting, so matrix, matrixes, matrices, that's the proper plural, are essentially a group of other fields. Um, it's a way to nest your fields down so that users can create kind of repeated sets of the same field, essentially. So when we're creating these block types here, it's giving us this option to create a new block type. We're creating a new set of repeated fields. So I'm gonna say new block type. I'll call this block type link item to represent each individual item in our list. And really the only field that we need on each item is this special link field that I just installed via a plugin. And I, I wanna call it just link, but link is actually a reserved word in the crafts templating language. So I have to change the handle to be custom link instead of link. But the actual title can just stay as link. And then if I come down here, uh, this link field option in our field type dropdown was not here earlier. Um, it was added when I installed that plugin. So I'll change the field type to be link type. Um, and then we're presented with a whole bunch of options here. And really quickly, I'm just gonna deactivate the ones that I don't care about. I'll show what all this means in just a second. Boom, 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 and then this. So what I'm doing right here is by default, users can create links to assets in the system or various categories. Categories are another concept in Craft that I'm not gonna get into tonight. Um, Craft is also, also has multi-site support, so you can have one Craft control panel that powers multiple domains. Um, this gives us the ability to link to another site. We're gonna turn that off, and also the ability to link to individual users. We don't really want them to do any of that kind of stuff in the navigation, so I've disabled all those. And then I've also turned on the ability for them to add an ARIA label and a title to this link. So I'll go ahead and click Save, and now we have our new link group field, and if I go into Globals, navigation, field layout, now I can kind of do what we did before, but just use this new link group field. And if I go back to globals, we can see in this navigation section, we now have this link group field where we can add new link items, and here's all the fields that that plugin added for us. So we can um, add in some custom text, like we're gonna add in the home page. We can choose which entry in our system this links to, so that's gonna be the home page. We could also add in an ARIA label or a title. And now that we have all that content in here, we can just click the button again, and we get another set of those same fields. 
Um, this one's going to be for the blog page. And we will choose blog listing and save that. So that's what a matrix is for. A matrix is for a repeatable set of fields. Um, next, let's put together the fields for individual blog posts. But before I do this, I also need to set up Craft's, app, Craft's asset system. So by default, there's no, um, by default, Craft should have kind of an assets section here in the sidebar, but it doesn't, and that's because we haven't told Craft where we want all our assets to be stored. So if I go in here to settings, assets, I can create a brand new asset volume, and I'm just gonna call this public. And asset volumes can either just be um, folders on your actual system or your server or whatever, or you can install plugins to store assets on some kind of object storage like Amazon S3 or DigitalOcean's object storage or whatever. Um, for this demo, we're just going to store it on our actual um, computer. So right here, it's asking me for this file system path. And in here, I can use what's called an alias. I used one of these earlier. The alias was at web. I'll show it that is equal to in a minute, but aliases are just a way in craft fields to represent some kind of um, environment variable, sort of. So right here, I'll say at root, and then this dropdown is showing that root is equal to this path on my computer. Um, and since I want assets to be accessible publicly, that means they need to go in my project's public directory, which I mentioned earlier was forward slash web. And then also, I want all my assets to go in a top level folder in that directory called assets. So whenever I add a new image to craft, it's going to put it in this folder for me. And then I also want to check this box that says assets in this volume have public URLs. And I'm going to, as the base URL for each of these, I'm going to say at web forward slash assets. And you can see that that at web was equal to my current site's uh, web address, which is just localhost right now. And also, we have this field layout manager here as well, and this is a way that we can attach fields directly to assets. So I could add in like an alt text field for all of my site's images right here, and then every time someone uploads an image, they automatically would have to enter in an alt text. I'm not gonna add that in right now. So now that I click save here, we have this new assets section where we could come up here and upload our own files. Um, So now that I have the assets set up, I also, let's go ahead and start setting up our blog detail page. So let's run back to what I had here and go to that uh, test blog post. Um, blog posts have a title. Entries also have their own title. We can probably just reuse that title field right here. Uh, the blog post also has a description. So I'll reuse that description field. And then in here, we have kind of a rich text area, but also, I'm gonna kind of make this um, image its own special piece of content so that I can do um, things like image cropping or something with it. Craft also provides APIs for automatically cropping images when you use them, which is super handy. So what I'm actually gonna do is make this blog content section instead of just a massive rich text field, I'm gonna use a matrix block, block and I'll have rich text fields as well as image fields that users can add at their own will and reorder whenever. Um, and then one last field that I know I'm going to need is this preview image right here. Users should be able to set their own preview that will show up on the actual blog listing page. So let me run back to settings. And we'll create a new field type. Uh, I already mentioned we had the title and the description kind of figured out. So I do need to create the preview image field. So I'm going to create a new field called preview image. And I'm going to set the field type here to be assets, and then it provides me with a whole bunch of options. Kind of the most important one right here is this restrict allowed file types. I only want images to be able to be uploaded, and this covers PNGs, JPEGs, GIF files, and I think SVGs can be uploaded as well. And then I, um, by default, when you create a new uh, asset field type, you can upload as you can choose as many assets, assets as you would like. Um, I want to limit it to just one. Users should only choose one preview image instead of like six. So I'll, I'll add this limit here of one. Go ahead and save that. Um, we already have the description field, so the other, only other thing is all those pieces of content that make up the actual blog post. And so I'm gonna do that with a matrix field type. 
So I'll say matrix, and I'm going to call this content blocks. And then I'm going to create a new blog type, block type called image block. And this will be for images. It'll just have one field called image. Um, we're going to make this a required field, so users have to select an image when they're setting this up. This is going to be an assets field limited to one asset at a time, and we're going to limit it to images. And then also, we have a rich text block. I'll create that as well. We'll just have one field called text. <clears throat> and earlier when I installed that typed link field plugin, I also installed this other plugin called Redactor. Um, Craft has almost no opinions, as I mentioned, so much so that it doesn't even have an opinion on what rich text editor you use in your CMS. It has a variety of plugins for various rich text editors. Um, the one that has primarily come pre-installed with Craft in earlier versions has been Redactor, and it's definitely the most popular and well-supported one, but there are plenty of third-party ones. So Redactor is just a rich text editor. So under text here, I'm gonna change the field type to be a redactor field type, which is essentially just rich text. Um, and then also craft, when you install redactor, you can set up various configurations. So you can set up a very simple redactor rich text field that just has like a bold and italic option, or you can do a much more robust one that has heading options, image options, video options even. I'm going to leave this as standard, which comes with all the heading options as well. I want them to be able to choose their own headings in this rich text field. Um, and that is basically it for this matrix block. We'll go ahead and save this. And then we'll run back to settings, sections, and we'll edit our blog post entry type. Going to do that same thing where I add a tab of content. I also didn't mention earlier, but you can add as many tabs as you want and kind of split up the fields across tabs. So what I'll like to do is if there's kind of some more like setting-based fields, I'll usually put those in a tab called settings and then keep all the content-based fields in a content tab um, so that it's very easy for someone just to edit the content and not get bogged down with all the various settings the, pages has, the page has. Um, we already have the title field by default, so I'm going to add in the description field, the preview image field, and then the uh, content blocks field. And I'm going to remove this other tab because we don't need it. I'll save that, go back into entries, go into blog posts, and edit this blog post. And now we have our description, the ability to choose a preview image. And then also, we have this content block section where we can add in a rich text block. And then directly after that, an image block, another image block, another rich text block. And we can order these however we want. Um, also, you can kind of you can double click on these to minimize them so that you don't get bogged down as soon as you open the page with all the content on it. Instead, just see a high level overview. And we also have this option here to instantly reorder any of these fields, so we can easily just move stuff around on our site. And then there's also a handful of fields to set up on the home page, but we are kind of running a little bit tight on time, so I'm actually just going to uh, load up a database dump. Um, that has all the fields for the home page set up. So let me check out this master branch. By the way, all the code for this demo is up on my GitHub, uh, glitchmob forward slash, I think it's craft dash CMS dash demo, and all this code is available up on there. So let me quickly run into my SQL server and drop this database. Uh, craft demo. Okay, and then um, okay, and we're good. So now, if I go back to the admin, we should see. I'll get logged out, of course. But if I log back in. We have essentially the same thing we had before, but if I go into like the home page, I now have a slider matrix field. Um, I have this image callout set field, and um, also this 
two column callout matrix block which represent each of these uh, pieces of data right here. And also all the test content is in there as well. We're looking at the finished product here with all the finished code, which is why everything is hooked up. So let me switch back to what we had before. And now we should see it's kind of back to just the static version. Hmm. Thank you. Yep. That was a useless command. Now if I refresh, now we're back to just the static content. So let's start with um, this navigation stuff up here at the top. So if I come in here to this base.twig file, this is kind of our base HTML template. So we have our opening head and body tags. We have a handful of metadata in here. Um, we have a little bit of twig code right here. I'm not going to dive too deep into what this does. I'm pulling in Bootstrap as well as a style sheet on, in our own project. And then right here in this body tag, there's this include directive, which literally just kind of copies and pastes another file right here. You can conceptually think of it as that. Um, and then we also have this main tag with this block main. If you're familiar with any templating language out here, this probably, you feel right at home with this, but I'll explain this in more detail in a second. But the important part is this includes navigation.twig. So if I go to this includes folder, I have a navigation.twig file with just the code for my nav bar up at the top. And thinking about the, the dynamic pieces of content in here, really it's just these individual nav items. Remember, I made that link group field and added, um, it was a matrix block that had links inside of it, link items. So each of these right here become those link items. Um, and then this anchor tag inside would become the actual link field that I had. So I'm going to remove this duplicated one, and we're going to work with just this guy. So the matrix block um, provides an API that will essentially give you an array of all that data, all the data in all those fields. Um, and once we have an array, we can loop over it. So I'm going to use a for loop um, for link item in. And then how do we access that data? How is Craft going to give that to us? And before I mentioned that Craft has these, this idea of globals, global pieces of data. And when I created that navigation global, whatever is the handle for it, which in this case is just navigation all lowercase, Craft automatically provides that as a global variable we can use in any of our templates to access that data. So I'll just say navigation, and we had added one field to that navigation global, which was link group. And then link group itself was a matrix field. And the API to grab all the data from the matrix field and return it as an array is dot all. So I'll run this as like a method here. And then I need to put in a closing tag for this for loop. And I'll move all of my template into here. So right now, if I come back over to my markup or to the, the demo, we should see there's two of them. They're just repeated because we haven't plugged in the rest of the fields into the individual pieces they need to go into. So right off the bat, we, we essentially had just had that one field, custom link is what I called it. Um, and the uh, link field plugin I'm using gives us a really handy API to just get the entire anchor tag all at once. So I'll say link item dot custom link, because that's what I called it on each individual one. And it provides us a, a method called get link. And this will return an anchor tag with all the data where it needs to go. So if I run back here and refresh, we see here we have home and blog, but it's also styled really weird. And that's because the anchor tag that it's spitting out doesn't have this class of nav link. Um, but this method provides a way for us to add our own custom class by specifying a class, nav link. And then I'll cut out this part. And now if we go back, we should see we now have home and blog, which are being controlled from that navigation global in the CMS. And I can click through, and they click to the actual pages that they're supposed to go to. <coughs> um, so next, let's, uh, let's hook up this blog listing page, because this is kind of another simple one. So if I come in here to pages and go to blog listing, um, right here up at the top, we have our, 
our headline and our piece of text right here. And I had called those fields just headline and description. And so at this point, craft is, has, we, when we set up this section, we pointed a URL to this template. So craft knows what URL is there and also what content is there, and it's rendering out a template for us. What craft will do is whenever it's rendering out a template for a specific entry, in this case, the blog listing entry, um, it will provide us with a variable just called entry, and we can access all of our fields directly on that variable. So the field that we had created was headline, and then right here, let me close this, the field was just um, description. So now if I jump back and refresh, now we see my lorem ipsum that I had entered into the CMS earlier today is showing up as well as the uh, headline. And then the other thing was we have the, this blog listing section that's supposed to show all of the actual blog posts in the system. And we didn't ever create a field called like blog posts where we would add in all the blog posts or anything. So how do we access this data that lives in a different section entirely inside you know, our current entry that we're trying to render out? And Craft provides a really robust API that we can use anywhere in the system to just grab pieces of data out of the CMS. So up here at the top, I'm gonna use a special template tag called set, which will just create a brand new variable for me. So I'll say set posts, I'm creating a variable called posts, and that'll be equal to craft.entries, and this is just kind of a global variable that's always available to us in every Twig template. Craft.entries.section, and then in here we'll pass in the handle of the section, which was just blog posts, and then we'll say dot all to retrieve them. And so now we're presented with an array of all the blog posts in our section. So if I come down here, the repeatable bit is this markup. So I'll say for post in posts. And I'll move all this stuff up, yeah. up into there. And then we need to plug in um, all the various pieces of content. So right here we had this uh, description so we probably want to replace this with the individual post description. So I'll just say post.description. And then this right here needs to link to the actual blog detail page. And so we'll replace that with post.url. If I come back here and refresh, we have some different text here. And if I click, now we go to the actual blog, uh, the blog detail page. The last bit to hook up here is the image itself. And remember, I had kind of ahead of time added a preview image field to each individual blog post. And we can go ahead and use that right here. So when we're accessing image images in Craft, um, the asset field that I had added earlier can have kind of a variable number of images by default. Um, we had limited it to one, but we kind of have to do a little bit of gymnastics to actually retrieve the image. And you'll, you'll see why why we actually have to do this in a minute. But what I'll start by doing is say set image equal to post dot image. And then I could do dot all here to get back an array, or I can just say dot one to grab the one that I care about. And then the other thing that we wanna do is make sure that we check if this image actually exists because this dot one, um, th this dot one method could technically return null or like a, you know, an empty value, because um, even though we may make the re field required in the CMS, there's actually nothing stopping users from going to the asset manager and deleting the image later. And we don't want that to throw an error on our site. So we're gonna just safely check and make sure that there is an image there um, before we render it out. So once we have this image variable and we can ensure that it exists, we can just say image.url. But what's really cool about Craft is there's an additional API to grab an image with specific dimensions and Craft will automatically crop the image to fit in those dimensions. So if I come in here and say set, I'm gonna move this down here. I'm gonna say set, I'm just gonna call this options. I'm gonna say equals this object. We're gonna say the mode 
is crop because we want crop craft to crop the image. We'll say width is, um, I think it was 350. Yeah, 350, and then the height was 250. Oh, yep. Thank you. And then instead of calling URL, we'll say get URL and pass in these options as an argument. And so now, if I jump back over here and refresh, thank you. I'm all over the place today. Okay, now if I refresh, um, possible to invoke. Oh, this isn't called image, it's called preview image. I did that when I was practicing too. <laughs> okay, now we're not getting any image at all. Why might that be? Preview image. Oh, wait. Well, that's right. Oh, I know what it is. Um, <laughs> this is a stupid issue, but when I'm using the local like PHP built-in web server, the image cropping sometimes causes a segmentation fault, and so I just have to like restart my server. Mm -hmm. Something that never happens in production, but happens when you're like using the PHP built-in server that's not super good. So now if I refresh, there we go. It's generated the, a brand new image at the dimensions that we specified. And so if I like open this up in a new tab, we can see that it is actually 350 by 250. The original image is like 1920 by 1080. Can I see that pattern? No, the URL pattern for the image. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it, it generates the name of this uh, folder right here based on the options that I gave it. Yep, it caches this out so it only has to run it once. Um, you can also, when you're creating your assets, you can also specify a list of asset transforms. Um, so you can say header, and then whenever in your template code, you can just pass in the name of that asset transform header so you can define all this stuff ahead of time. I normally don't like to do that because then if I have to change, what happens is this URL pattern will say underscore header in it instead of these dimensions that I specified. And so if I change the dimensions later, it won't, it might regenerate the image, but it's the same URL, and so it's cached in a lot of places. And so I usually like to just specify it in my template, so I get this really awesome, very specific URL. Um, you can go either way, though. Okay, so this is our, um, our blog listing page. If we added another blog post, it would also show up right, right beside here. Uh, what are we doing for time? We can probably do... I'm not gonna hook up the home page right now. You can check out the, the repository later for how I hooked all that up. But I do wanna show off how to hook up the blog detail page. Okay, so right off the top here, we had one field called description. So I'll add that in. I'll say entry dot description. And then I have this whole rich text section and an image. And remember I had this matrix field called uh, content blocks and it's a matrix field so we can loop over it so I'll say for block in entry dot content blocks dot all and then I'll close that for tag and then there's a special very uh, property on these block objects called type so I can say if block dot type is equal to and then I'll just compare it against the handle so if it is equal to image block, then I want to render out the image. And let me jump back into our blog listing and kind of grab all this code for getting an image. So if it's equal to image block, then we want to grab that image, set image equal to block image dot one. And then let me replace this class here. And then the options, I think it's like, I have like 600 in here or something, by like 300. I don't remember what the dimensions were. It's not super important. And then after this if statement right here, we can add an else if block dot type is equal to our rich text block and then we'll just render out a rich text div and say block dot text and then I'm going to use this special filter here called raw um, 
Basically what this does underneath the hood is raw is like a function and the templating language will take this value and pipe it through this function. And this just disables all the automatic escaping that Twig will do to ensure that we don't have any like XSS vulnerabilities. Because um, we normally don't want to uh, trust user input, but since it's coming from users we generally t trust, it's fine to say raw. So now if I come back here and refresh, our blog detail page. Um, let me make sure it did crash again, dang it. There we go. Now we have our image in there and our rich text and we could go add in more fields and they would be rendered out appropriately. Um, and I'm not gonna hook up the home page right now. Once again, you can just kind of look at the, uh, the code demos to, to see all that stuff. Um, so we're kind of at time right now um, if anyone wants to, if, if anyone is against me going over, um, I won't do it. You have, well, I can still wait for some questions, but I do want to take a second and show off the actual like production project that is out there in the wild right now. Um, so late last year, let me get out of presentation mode. Uh, we put together a site for one of our clients um, called Paragon 360, that's the name of their business, and we, we built them a site using Craft CNS. And we launched it early this year, like in January. Yeah, I guess that's when we launched it. So I'm gonna open this up here. And we'll run. And we'll go back in here, local host, 8,000. Okay, so this is their front end. Let me go into their admin real quick. So right off the bat, there's a whole lot more stuff in the sidebar, but I just kind of want to focus for a second on what's in entries because that's the generally important part. So right off the bat, we kind of broke down their site into kind of services and projects and industry. These were kind of some top level big things in their system that was kind of custom to them. So these are all various content types that they can create. But the kind of important thing that we did for the rest of the pages, we, we just created a section called pages. And this, this section, um, before when I was creating sections, there was kind of a drop down that said like channel or single, and there was another one called structure. And structure is for content that has kind of a nesting structure to it. So right here, we're kind of looking at all their pages on their site. And we can see that this like success page is nested underneath contact. And what this means is that when someone goes to forward slash contact, forward slash, forward slash success, this is the page that gets rendered out. Um, so normally what we do is we kind of wrap up all the pages into one nice pages section instead of keeping those all in just singles. Um, and then another thing that we do that's really, really cool, if I create a brand new page, we only have a couple of fields here. Um, but with, just with these handful of fields, we can get really dynamic in how we put the site together. So when Paragon wants to, comes to us and wants some crazy new page, we actually don't have to write any new code. They can reuse all the pieces from the rest of their site. So right off the bat, uh, let me show off the live preview mode. I'll just call this test. We'll add in this small header here. We'll just pick some test images. And we can kind of see right here, it's just like live reloading, except my PHP server probably crashed again, dang it. on maybe not oh it came back to life after it did it so like as I'm putting things together it's like automatically reloading the site so we have this field here called blocks where we can just throw together we essentially took the site as a whole and cut it into all these smaller pieces that could be reused on any other page so right here this is just a rich text block I can add in some test text here and it shows up we have various sliders, various um, card sets. Um, right here, this contact call out, this is like you know, their map with their about information. They can throw that on any page easily. Um, and the templating to hook this up is surprisingly simple. Um, we can just, instead of breaking the site down into the various pages, we break it down into the various blocks and the content editors can make the pages as they wish. So that's kind of what I wanted to show off really quickly with, with Paragon is what um, what it looks like to have a much more, a lot more content in there than just our simple little demo could put together. So, I'll go ahead and open it up to some questions. Shoot, Jason. Does um, Craft CMS offer sort of a headless mode where if you want to throw a SPA on top of it, you can still use the backend in it, or 
um, there not. Um, there's definitely plenty of benefit. You know, number one, if you're going to build like a mobile app that needs to be powered by the content in the site, having right. a headless option is really awesome. Craft doesn't support that out of the box, but there are a lot of plugins that do. There's this one that I'm thinking of right now called CraftQML, or not CraftQML, CraftQL, um, which is essentially just a GraphQL wrapper around all of your content. Oh, wow. It analyzes your content and just gives you a GraphQL endpoint to hit for all of it. Um, it can get a little tricky to use it if you need to like secure the content in some way, um, but if you're just if it's just public content, it's very straightforward to use. Read a, a bunch of read yes, exactly. I mean, well, with GraphQL, there is no there's one endpoint. Well, I'm right. But a read-only view. Yes, yes. Um, there's also a plugin called what's it called? I can't remember the name of it right now, but it's by Pixel and Tonic, I think, and it's essentially a way to just define your own endpoints and then you feed in with a little bit of PHP code what content should come out of craft at those endpoints. So you can kind of build your own custom REST APIs with the, uh, with the content, but it doesn't have that by like default. It's a plugin. Element API. Element API, yep, that's what it is. Any other questions? Tom, you said you had a bunch. Can I, can I get a better glance of what some of the built-in field tests are? Sure, totally. Um, let me, for this, let me jump back. Yeah, it was probably a little bit small. Uh, let me jump back to the little test project because this uh, this Paragon site has quite a few plugins installed that added their own. So let me jump back here. Okay, let me refresh. Okay, so if I go to settings, fields, new field, and field type, we have assets to link to assets, categories to link to categories if we created them, general checkboxes, colors, date times, drop downs, um, entries, this is to link to other entries. This is kind of like a, a relationship field essentially. The one way to do like a relationship field. Is it light switch? Um, that's essentially a toggle switch. It's like this, it's a fancy uh, checkbox. Yeah, uh, multi-select, number, radio buttons. Um, and then user fields, tags, all that kind of stuff. So these are the built-in ones. The only one that isn't is this uh, link field and the redactor field. Okay, so that leads into another question. So what about tagging? Have you used tagging much again? Uh, yes, so <sighs> tags are, so there's two different ways to like tag things. There's categories and then also tags. Um, what's really lame about craft is craft has tags but no way to manage them. What you do is you create a tag field, add it to some entry type, and then you can essentially just create your own fields in, or own tags inline, but there's no way to delete them once you've created them. Mm -hmm. There is a tag manager plugin to manage them after that though. And then there's also a whole querying language under that craft.entries API to grab fields based on tags. I assume once you've set a slug, the slug stays the same even though you change your title. Do you use that a way to overwrite that? Or um, so the slug is automatically generated the first time it never changes, but that is an editable field that you can go in and edit. There is a really cool plugin called Redactor, or not Redactor, sorry, Retor, um, that whenever you change uh, entry slug, it automatically adds a 301 redirect for you. Right. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, how robust is the query? So I saw that you pulled a list of blog posts. Mm -hmm. Based on like the section? Yeah, or, or, or other things when you get into nesting, uh, when you get into tagging. I mean, I'd say it's fairly robust. Um, there's an entire like searching, search-based API where I could say craft.entries. I think just search, and then I can. There's like a whole bunch of ways I can query based on some kind of search string, yeah. like this field is equal to this value or something, or fuzzy matches this value. Do you have any idea what it's doing behind the scenes for that indexing? Is it using MySQL or the database, or is it using like QC or something like that? Um, it's it's using MySQL. So. Craft is meant to be like deployed to your basic like shared hosting setups. So it does as much as it can in the database. Um, but there are plugins to hook it up to like um, Elasticsearch for, for much more advanced querying. Asset volumes. Uh huh. That's for the S3 stuff out of the box or is that a plugin? That's a plugin made by Pixel and Tonic. So it's a first party plugin. Um, and it's a really simple install and you provide it your AWS keys and stuff like that and it hooks it up. Uh, on your matrix fields. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Oftentimes, though, it's too 
It does that by default. We didn't get to see that because I never entered in any content. We don't have, you don't have any control over what shows up in there. It just kind of like looks at the fields inside of it and tries to give you a basic idea um, right at the top level. Good questions. <laughs> no, these are these are great. But yeah, does anyone else have any other questions? Yeah, you could reuse a field. That's normally through a plugin, though, uh, the relabel plugin, to like relabel Can fields. Add to the field layout? Can't rename you can't rename it right there. That's through a plugin. Oh, okay. Yep. But there is a plugin called relabel, so you can like reuse these same base fields you've created over and over again. Yeah, this field creation is kind of an interesting concept. Right. I was a little surprised when you received that. That was nice. Except that you, one of the scenarios you may run into, right, is when you have a field that slightly means something different to a different data type. Uh-huh. Um, right. We already used. It's totally. Hard, it's hard to explain the scenario, but. No, I, I kind of think, I think I'm understanding what you're saying, but yeah. That's where that relabel plugin can kind of come in handy, so that you can give it some different, a different like help text and different description based on the context. Um, one thing that does become like a massive pain is when you're trying to do like this really structured type of content, like we do with our blocks field. Yeah. And we have to, when I was creating this matrix, I was having to recreate these fields for every single matrix instead of being able to reuse for every block type, if you will. Um, there is a really handy plugin called Neo, which basically is a replacement for the matrix field that lets you reuse fields from anywhere in the system. So that's a really handy plugin too. I like, so, so I gotta admit, so the, the statement about the plugins, and in your, your continued statement about you know, plugin for that or plugin for this, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I can understand because that. Because I realize it's new and that, that these things are bringing really important aspects mm -hmm. to, the, to the game. We try to stay super vanilla, though, right? We try to right. stay super vanilla so that way, three or four years down the road, I have a really safe upgrade pad. That's very true. To that's that's game. totally true because right now, um, Craft 3 came out in April, and it's kind of a massive pain to upgrade a Craft 2 site to a Craft 3 site because there's all these plugins that only exist yeah. in Craft 2 and aren't in your updated one. So I totally understand that. I think Craft's reasoning behind that is they want to be as low level as possible so that people can do anything with the system, right? Instead of you know having to make whatever they're trying to do fit into craft, they want craft to fit into anything else. And so usually how that ends up is through these lots of plugins. Yeah. Well, we, we try to at least limit if we're gonna pick a plugin, we pick something that we know we can recreate if we had to. Right, we just yeah, that's true as well. That kind of thing. Yeah. That's good stuff. Um, That's very true as well. That's awesome. Hey, so yeah, I know I knocked it with the, the plugin thing. This is awesome. <laughs> I, I am a big fan of Craft. I've been using it basically like shortly after Craft 3 came out, um, so almost for the past year, and I've had tons of fun with it. It's a really cool you're, platform. You're telling many of the similar stories that I love about Embraco, mm -hmm. uh, but some of the speed that you've got here, and it seems like a little bit lighter Right. Uh, for yeah. some of that kind of stuff. It might be a really great go-to. So right now, right. the Bronco thing is a go-to for us, right? Sure, Maybe totally. Except for this, spin it up, create your fields, go. This right. is the same concept. Right. Uh, a little faster, a little leaner here. Right. Uh, so. And, and, and the number of use cases you're handling right out of the gate, it's a boatload, man. It, it kind of is, the, which is a super, super good plus one for craft. Um, we're coming from like Wagtail. We use Wagtail tons at Mostly Serious for previous projects. And it's kind of the same scenario. It's like craft is so much faster to set up and like set up all these fields. With Wagtail, we're having to create all these Python classes to represent all of our data, which in many scenarios is actually what you want because your data model is so much more complicated than just basic content. But really when we're trying to you know push out marketing sites all the time, and it really is just about the content. This seems, this works really well for us. Yeah, that, that querying story would be a big one for me. Right. Yeah. Uh, understanding some of those scenarios so where the sites would get a little bit deeper and work a little bit more structured. Totally. The yep. Is uh, they they do have a decent amount of documentation on their querying. One kind of note I will say about Craft is when it comes to the plugin development, your documentation is the Craft source code. Sadly, they are working on the docs. Very. They've said that it's a focus for this year to get their docs up to par, but right now their docs are kind of terrible. As far as the like templating and using Twig, there's a decent amount on there and a decent amount on the querying part, but the custom plugin development is definitely a toughie right now because the documentation is kind of poor. All right, so do we have, what, what are you using for your editor here? Uh, for the rich text editor? No, 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 your uh, uh, IDE. Your oh, I'm using PHP Storm. Okay, 
So, so any, any great intelligence here at all? Um, so right. Entry content blocks and stuff like that, and I thought, man, that'd be awesome. Right, it would be. If it would pick up your entry, at least your entry to your model. Sadly, no. Um, so I, I know that Umbraco will like generate classes behind the scenes based on all your data. Strongly typed stuff. Right. right. Um, PHP is a strongly typed language, sort of, but um, Craft doesn't do any of that automatic generation of classes. In fact, even Twig support in um, in uh, PHP Storm is kind of lacking. You can't do debugging. You can't debug t Twig templates right now, um, and the auto completion is meh at best. That would be crazy sexy because then you yeah. can build something and hand it off to somebody else and they can start exploring. Right. Yeah, that would, that would be really cool. That would be really cool. Have you not tried Docker for your for your um, main engine running that? Uh, I have not. I'm not super on the up and up with Docker, but I have thought about it because it is annoying to have it crash every time it tries to generate an image. I've, I've gotten rid of Apache on my Mac and mm -hmm. I use a Docker Compose for all of my stuff. Right. Uh, yeah, that's a really good idea. Well. Yep. We'll try it out someday. This is awesome. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Well, we'll call it at that. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And I'll be hanging around a little while afterwards if anyone does have any more specific questions. But thank you for coming.